As you can tell from the title of this talk, um, I'm going to be talking about diffusion models. Uh, this talk was originally given as part of the Machine Learning Singapore Meetup Group. Uh, I gave this talk about two weeks ago. Um, if you're interested in this kind of content, please subscribe. Um, but also, please feel free to join the Machine Learning Singapore Meetup um, where we have this stuff live um, and then you can participate um, in real time. The approach I'm going to take is basically to look at the history of the ideas um, that have arisen within diffusion models. Um, while the diffusion idea is quite old, um, this whole um, sudden evolution of, of ideas has occurred since the beginning of COVID. So we're talking about relatively recent times, even in deep learning terms. Um, I'm also going to talk about um, some of the extras like in painting or, or deriving you know, nice pictures from drawings and also how this might be applied to other fields um, and we're seeing results of this already including recently to movies so that's within the last two weeks um, so in terms of history I'm going to cover a, a bunch of different models from the original DDPM the denoising diffusion probabilistic models um, through DALI and CLIP which weren't exactly uh, diffusions but they can carry important messages in terms of how we're going to deal with text. Um, I'll talk about OpenAI and diffusion, uh, classifier free guidance, um, and then move on to latent diffusion, glide in the current state of play. Um, after that, we, we, can move, we can talk about more specifically about stable diffusion, how that works, and, and then I'll you know, move to the next steps. So for the first of these models, which is DDPM, this is 2020-06, after the beginning of COVID for real, um, along came a, an, a nice model which described the process. So this is a diagram you'll have seen, you may have seen a few times before, and um, I'm not going to get delve into the mathematics too deeply, um, but let's at least lay some groundwork with the, the notation. So what, they, what we normally do is look on the right hand side of this diagram where you have a genuine picture and that's going to be the x0 that's the real picture and then successively we're going to apply this q process to make the picture more and more noisy now so the, the actual picture going you know, from x to t is going you know, backwards so making it noisier is actually a kind of an easy process because all we have to do is add some noise to the pixels. Um, the tricky process is how to unnoise it. But given that we can make a noisy picture and then we know all of the steps in between, actually training a model to do the denoising, we've, we've set ourselves up for success in some ways. Um, we can also see this kind of process in many of the other unit models where you might take, say, a color picture make it black and white and then say okay how do I make a black and white picture color I've already got I've given myself a task where I know the the beginning and end so we kind of set ourselves up in the same way for diffusion um, please someone asked me for the slides um, all of these links are clickable you can find slide papers and code and extra so in terms of noising this each de each noising step we're going to essentially reduce the size of, or reduce the magnitude of the image pixels a little bit and kind of replace it with Gaussian noise. Now this, this N is just a normal, uh, normal distribution, kind of the, the typical bell shape uh, curve. And so what you do is as you keep adding the noise and kind of shrinking the, the pixel magnitude from before, gradually the noise comes to dominate, if not completely swamp out to the original picture. So when you get to the full XT, you time it so that at that point, you're at a pure noise kind of uh, distribution. So one of the nice things with this adding a normal distribution at each step is if I add a bell-shaped curve to another bell-shaped curve, um, I get yet another bell-shaped curve. So we can compute exactly the statistics at every step because we're using these nice Gaussian distributions. So this is what is this, the accumulated normals um, for all of these time steps are also normal noise. But essentially that means we can calculate what the statistics for the normal distribution any time should be without going through all of the steps. We know for sure just by moving in you know, one leap, 
we'll know what the distribute what noise we have to add. So we don't actually have to run this process of noising the image um, you know, to, to it expensively. We can do it in one step, we can compute any any transition we want and then just train the model to know how to do all the transitions uh, and within a batch we could do um, to, and you would want to uh, do a batch with lots of different images all at different time steps so it learns lots about the distribution of everything rather than just one image at every time step all in one batch where it would tend to not learn as well you want to mix in a batch Now in terms of denoising, what we're going to do is use this function p with a little theta, and the theta are the parameters of a unit. So a unit is a, a diagram which I've got a little later, um, but basically this is how you would typically used for something like uh, turning a black and white picture into a color picture, or it could be working out the image segmentation of a scene for self-driving into where is the road, where are the trees. So UNET is maps pixels into pixels, but it also, because of the, the, the U shape of this thing, and we will see what that means, um, it takes into account like the, the a hierarchy of different sizes within the image. So what we want to do when we're doing this denoising is we're going to try and guess what the cleaner um, image pixels are, are going to be. And in fact, we don't actually specifically want to guess what the actual image is. What we really care about is what is the distribution of what a good image would look like. So this is kind of a statistical um, feature that, that you know, people like to see. Rather than guessing what the image is, what we're going to try and guess is what are, what are the distribution of images which would have given, ri given rise to this noisy image. Um, but because all of these changes are Gaussian, it's actually su sufficient to guess, well, what is the mean of that distribution? And we actually know what the, the variance is going to be. Uh, we can kind of hand wave it away. Um, but people have found that just guessing the mean is good enough. Um, what we've also found is that it's actually more stable to predict the changes in the pixels, like how much have I got to change this fuzzy image to make a good image, rather than judging from these pixels what are the exact pixel values. Clearly, I could take my original image, add the changes, and now I've got the final image. But it's more stable to predict like what are the errors which I'm trying to fix up. So here's a diagram of the unit, um, where essentially we're going to take in the original image, which is the noisy version, and then using a CNN of some kind, map it onto the output image. But we'll also downscale it to something of maybe half the resolution. And we're going to then map that into a downscaled version and then use that upscaled to add on to like more information, which is gathered from more of the whole image. We're going to do this several times, and you can see why this is going to be called a UNET. By having these skip connections and this downsizing and upscaling um, will enable us to you know, get information from the whole image so it's like a coherent image. Now, uh, another feature of this uh, denoising process that we're going to do, because we're doing it lots of different time steps, we need to inform our one UNET what time is it? Like, am I trying to deal with extremely noisy image, making it just a little bit less noisy? Or am I right at the other end, trying to make a pretty good image even better? Or the final step will be, okay, make, an, make the image perfect. So we can tell it the time by adding in like a time embedding, which is basically the value t um, expanded into a bunch of different di um, dimensions, just like we would do with the positional encoding for a transformer. So if that doesn't make sense, um, just say, well, we're going to add some time information so it knows where it is. Um, later, we're also going to add some other information, like what am I trying to draw? Like what direction am I heading? For instance, am I trying to produce a picture of a cat or a dog? Or what sentence am I trying to represent? So there's kind of the opportunity to add in extra information where these layers can take that information and use it to um, inform how they're going to do this denoising. 
Okay, so if you were interested in actually following up more in terms of the maths reference, um, I would recommend uh, there's a very nice uh, explanation um, where the um, and I have links in here and I'll put links in the description um, where it's actually explained all of these different steps. I'm not going to um, replicate that here. There is a good explanation out there. Um, and it also delves into like what are the shortcuts which are being made and what terms are kind of thrown away um, because people find them you know, in practice not to matter. So there's a bit of a hand waving thing going on, um, but people have found techniques which really work. And that's what matters in many ways. So in terms of the original output that the paper had, um, back in the day, like basically two years ago, um, the state of the art for um, doing this kind of image generation with GANs would be to run it on something like the Elson bedroom samples. So this was a big data set of pictures of bedrooms and by training one of these things, you could get it to produce new pictures of bedrooms. So if you've seen uh, sites like this person does not exist, or this bedroom does not exist, this cat does not exist, these are the kind of data sets that they are trained on. But because it's trained on a bedrooms data set, you know that it's going to produce a bedroom, but you can't really direct what kind of bedroom it's going to be. So this is unconditional, like uncontrollable, and while these images look pretty impressive, they weren't as good as GANs were at, this, at that point. So this is kind of early days with diffusion is kind of a, a bit of an oddity to, to study this. Um, but at least it's getting somewhere with um, you know, producing bedrooms which don't exist. Um, slightly competitive. Okay. OK, so next up is probably at the beginning of 2021. Um, DALI and CLIP was announced by OpenAI. And this is the kind of the, the, the typical example we see from their awesome blog post is the armchair uh, in the shape of an avocado. So this was truly impressive at the time. Um, and the way in which this works was not a diffusion process. Um, it represented the images using a vision transformer kind of way, which basically is they represent patches of the image as tokens. And given that you can produce an image via these tokens, um, they, they make it so that essentially you can take in an image, convert it to tokens, use the same tokens, produce the same image. So basically this is a an autoencoder style um, model. But then basically once you've got some tokens, we can then say, well, suppose I had some tokens for uh, some text. I can then feed that into like a, a language model, which would take some tokens texty tokens and then produce some imagey tokens and I would then treat those output as the new image. So basically this is heading for what OpenAI has done really well or at that point was clear um, now clear for proficiencies for doing this, treating everything as like a language model. And so this was a it's not a diffusion thing. Um, this is very much a kind of language model type approach. Um, but one of the things which they used uh, this clip model for, which is a text orientated model, was to actually they train this model to tell the difference between is this image a good a good depiction of the text? So they can train this using the captions for a very large data set. So they have a caption with a known good image and then they train this contrastively. So what they do there is they essentially say, well, if this picture is of a, a picture of a beautiful tabby cat and there's a bunch of other uh, images in the same batch, they will then contrastly say it is a picture. These two things correspond, this caption and this picture, but all of the other ones are not examples of that. So these things are like the opposite of correct. So basically this pushes the representations that Clip has for all of the different texts into a space which relates images to text. So clip can be thought of as a text to image translation tool or at least a text to, to representation tool. So what they used clip here for was basically to kind of automatically cherry pick which images were good images of avocado um, shaped armchair. Um, and so they will generate maybe 50 images and then they pick the ones which the clip thing 
thought was most like the text. And so this is kind of auto cherry picking, a very smart idea, uh, nothing against um, the idea of having a model which generates huge numbers of samples and then pruning it, um, pruning the, the, the list, um, that works very well in many settings, um, but it's, it's slightly unfair to say that this is purely what Dali was doing, um, producing great images from the start. Basically, Dali's producing a lot of images and then they're pruned. I mean, they're also awesome images, but um, clip was also a big element of this. So this is kind of a diagram of the two sides of what Clip is doing. On the top here, we've got um, the text going in and being mapped through some kind of mapping. Um, on the bottom side, we've got the images coming in. This is also being mapped. And then this contrastive thing says, well, the two things which are the same should be, should be yes. The things which are not the same should be no. Um, then when, when it comes to actually using this, um, you can use it in a variety of ways. One of which is kind of uh, which is super cool is they can actually use this to examine ImageNet images just by saying, well, the, the caption should be, this is an image of a red panda, or this is an image of a cheetah. So they would essentially all the thousand classes in ImageNet, they would make a very small caption. And then just, they would say, well, what does Clip like for this image? And they found that they could actually do image net classification to quite a good degree of accuracy just using the clip model. So this is kind of a um, remarkable result. And what's more is they could also use not just the original image net images, but they could use cartoons of image net images. Um, so this is this uh, understanding of the image in big boats basically it far exceeded what a an image net train model could do. Basically, you could see that the clip model had extracted some kind of more semantic understanding of what was going on in images and text. So just after OpenAI came out with DALI, um, which was not a, tra not a diffusion model, um, you can see that they started to dip their toes in diffusion models, maybe um, thinking that this was an interesting thing, but maybe not un not seeing that this was the future um, to some extent. So uh, my guess is what happened is that the, these authors um, built systems to make sure that the whole diffusion thing can work um, and then started to chip away with just some results to make it a bit better so they can then essentially monetize this in a paper. Um, what they identified is that the scheduling done, which was typically done in thousands of steps, um, spend a lot of time um, in terms of improving the image, a lot of time fixing up very, very noisy images, and then to the same, like, uh, same intervals were then spent improving it towards the, f at the final steps. They reasoned, well, wouldn't it be more, worth more to, to essentially expand out um, the steps we, sp we spend making this a perfect image? Because when it's super noisy, it's not going to make that much difference whether we get it absolutely right. And so essentially by retiming the uh, the steps um, within this whole schedule of time steps, you can actually reduce the total number of steps required because you're focusing um, the you know, more steps on the last stages and you do comparatively fewer steps at the beginning. Um, so this is a kind of a nice result. It means that you can move from thousands of steps down to hundreds of steps. Um, and this then led to another paper, which is beating GANs. So here they started to look at ImageNet images and can we do um, ImageNet images produced um, to match the labels using these diffusion methods? And indeed you can, um, they can you can prove by using uh, essentially a machine learned statistic that these, the quality of these images starts to beat uh, something called Big GAN at the time. Um, and this was as little as 25 forward steps. So um, quite impressive uh, performance now, you, producing ImageNet-like images. And in particular, by using an ImageNet um, classifier, so you, you basically have a trained ImageNet classifier and then you ask it at each diffusion step, um, what would actually make this 
um, ImageNet class stronger. Like So I will do whatever it is to, to, to make my gradients move in the direction of this ImageNet class. Um, this required a, a, you know, taking the gradients through a bunch of stuff, um, but this would then enable it to guess the denoising steps better because you've got some gradients from this class. So one um, one twist is that you'd have to train the classifier not so it's perfect at uh, doing the classes at, with perfect images, but you can train the classifier so that it would also work on very noisy images of a, of a red panda. And so this is you know, not, not your standard classifier, but that signal, like is it getting closer to red panda or further away, um, was very valuable and could be then used to make good images. And you can see like from the top, um, whether you're just generating any old image from ImageNet or something directed, I guess, at a, like a corgi or something. Okay, so so using this kind of gradient idea um, does work, um, but something new came along. So the next thing that came along was from Google. So clearly, also, you know, all of the major players are, are playing with these models at this point. So now we're about a year ago. Um, and what Google has, my guess, after warming up these models, is to try and say, well, how do we train it without having a classifier? This classifier is a little bit embarrassing because we have to have, have to know all about our images before we can push them in a direction. And maybe we want to have guidance, which is difficult to differentiate through. So they developed a technique called classifier-free diffusion guidance. So what they do here is they have some like guiding information, like what is the class label we need? Um, and they can either give the either give the diffusion model no hint about what we need, in which case it will go and produce any old picture from ImageNet, like a good picture from ImageNet, or they say, well, we want the, the red panda. And so th because they're training this with an image of a red panda, they can either say, well, I want any old image and it will just happen to produce, happen to want to be a red panda, but they will do it with lots and lots of images. So the unguided version will give you basically any class in ImageNet. Or you say, ah, I, I expect you to give me a red panda. And then it says, oh, this red panda is, is where I should be going in response to that guidance. So the, the neat thing here is we haven't actually had to specify any gradients within this information. We just either give it the information or we don't give it the information. And the idea of not giving the information is we will also be training it on lots of other things so it knows what kind of no information feels like compared to here is a here's a big clue. So what happens here is you can then say, well, suppose I at test time, what I will do is I will give you two two goes. The first go, I won't tell you what we want. The second go, I will tell you what we're aiming at. So now I've got two different kind of denoised images, one without any guidance, one with the guidance. And then I can take the difference between those. So well, actually that difference, the only, only way in which we've got that difference is because of the guidance. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually take that difference and say, well, that is the, the value of the prompt had or, or the, the, the class. I'm going to use that as my new noised image. I can actually amplify that, not just using the image from the guided version. I can actually take a twice guided version, essentially taking the difference and doubling it up or tripling it up. So this classifier free guidance also gave rise to the effect of um, actually amplifying the guidance signal like up to up to 10 kind of thing. And so this is something we've got to be a bit careful because you might actually get to pixels which are whiter than white, right? They go outside the range um, that's allowed for pixel values. And so you may need to like cope with that because you know, suddenly we're doing something which isn't strictly mathematical at all. We've taken two things which have a difference, that makes sense. But now multiplying that number by 10 and just adding it on, that doesn't, strictly speaking, makes sense, um, apart from the fact that it works really well. And so this is where the technique of classifier free guidance comes along. And what you can see is this tends to produce much more varied examples of 
um, and much more distinctive examples. So on the um, on the left, we can see some. You know, here are some examples that we get. Um, but on the on the right, um, we've now got like a strong amplifier, strongly amplified classifier guidance. You can actually see that in the eyes of the cat, um, they're actually super saturated because it's been guided to be even more than it would do just for, I guess, Siamese cat. Okay, so now we're going to go on to just before Christmas um, 2021, um, two days, no, sorry, two papers were released on this one day. So both of these uh, teams must have been um, like kicking themselves um, because in the rush to get it out for Christmas, um, you know, that they overlap significantly. So th these are independent efforts. Um, simultaneous release, we've got Glide from OpenAI. Um, they produced code with Unfortunately, they, they released filtered models. So the models, while they kind of work, don't work for faces. They don't work in, in they don't work for any like sensitive subjects. Um, and also have a new lab here. This is the OMA lab in, in Europe. They also released code um, doing something with latent diffusion. Now this latent diffusion is going to form the basis of stable diffusion. So this is kind of one, one to watch here. Okay, so what is Glide? Um, Glide is a diffusion model, but instead of um, using the classifier free guidance uh, with the ImageNet class, what we're going to do is we're going to take the clip embedding and use that as the representation we kind of stuff in for every step of the denoising. So using this clip embedding and then having an attention mechanism um, to kind of inside the unit, um, so this is kind of a more sophisticated kind of information we're adding. Um, this can then drive the image generation via prompting. So this now we've got to the stage where we're actually using text to say, okay, where do we want this image to, to end up? Um, as I said, the OpenAI released a filter model, um, and this, from what from what I can tell outside OpenAI, is this is really what morphed into DALI version two, uh, which was released in April this year. Um, DALI is clearly a kind of a better marketing kind of name for this thing. Um, Glide or even Unclip, which is what it was kind of originally called in the paper, um, just aren't as sexy as DALI V2. Okay, so this is one of the pictures. Um, we, we kind of love the hedgehog with the calculator. Or whatever. Um, this is clearly remarkable at the time. Um, Let's also move on to what latent diffusion is doing. So latent diffusion was um, had some other qualities. In particular, it actually got started to get a bit better at representing things in the image, even the words in the image. So the one of the nice things here is they uh, open sourced the code um, and they credited it. There's an open AI code base and a Lucid Brains um, had nice PyTorch implementation, so it's, it's got good open source credentials. Um, and this is the one which was then morphed into stable diffusion, being trained by Stability AI and the people associated with that. So this is the big model which is causing all the recent kind of explosion of content and you know innovation um, in this field, because the Google models, the OpenAI models, are basically hidden either like fully within Google or behind APIs, which are you know, had a huge waiting list um, and various other you know, issues along with that. Uh, so latent diffusion is a very interesting model. Um, I'll get into kind of why it's, a, why it's interesting and specifically different um, just just now. So what they do, there are, there are a couple of models involved in this. The key thing with the the um, diffusion processes. This was kind of the same. So, so the bit in the the bit with all the steps and the units, that is kind of the same thing. They also had. You can see this QKV. This this is kind of shorthand for let's do some transformer attention on the prompt. So these steps within this diffusion process are pretty much the same as what other people were doing, but the twist here is with this E and D, this encoder and decoder. So instead of tr working uh, the diffusion process on raw pixels, which other people were doing, and other people had a lot of compute to be able to do, 
What this group did is they said, well, let's train up an encoder decoder so we can take an image in, encode it into a smaller image, right? Like a, a very rich representation and then such that that representation can get back to the same image. So basically, this is an autoencoder style thing through a small image, which is not pixels, some kind of representation space. So you might think of this as being like we convert the image, a PNG image into JPEG and then back to a PNG image. Whereas PNG is kind of lossless, JPEG is kind of lossy, but it's a pretty good um, correspondence. So here, we, we, it's definitely not a JPEG representation in the middle, but we're down to a much smaller representation, which means we can train our diffusion, which now noises up in the, this small latent space um, and does the denoising there and then can translate back into a nice image. Um, so you can go from a good image in, noise it up, denoise it, comes out, make a new nice image. So this is why it's called a latent diffusion. We're doing the diffusion not in pixels, but in this latent space. Um, as I said, the nice thing about this is that the latent space can be much smaller than the full size of the pixels thing. Um, and you know, going from 256 by 256, might, which might be a good pixel size, down to 64 by 64, you've actually saved a huge amount of compute. Um, just because you're not dealing with such large you know, areas. Okay, so now we've got kind of the, what the current state of play is. Um, uh, at this date here is as of our meetup, um, which is now about two weeks ago. Um, so we've got kind of th three big models on the scene. We've got DALI version two. Um, OpenAI is, is kind of trying to make this a bit more open uh, in terms of opening up the API, adding new things to the API as they see stable diffusion people handing out the code for free for, for some of these things. And we have Imogen from Google, um, which I'll explain a bit more about what they're doing um, here, or you know, this is a newer model, um, and also stable diffusion, which is a fully trained up version of the latent diffusion model, which has been released open source. So DALI which is, um, came out in April of 2022. Um, there's a nice paper, um, there's a beautiful website, uh, there's an API which you can get credits for, which you can then, you can pay for credits for, which you can then spend on making images. You have rights to use these images. Um, so if in a commercial setting, this is, would be just fine. Um, it, you know, there's some interesting results. There's also interesting negative results here. Um, if you ask for a sign that says deep learning, um, it it tries. Um, it's, it's remarkable that it has any success, but actually this isn't as good as it could be. Um, it's also interesting that it's been shown that OpenAI has manipulated prompts um, in order to make it so that their models don't take on the biases which they have from the data set. So data set, if I'm looking for stock images of a doctor, it's probably going to produce quite a biased range of images. OpenAI wanted to avoid that, um, as, as you know, would be reasonable. But you can prove that they're doing something to your prompt without asking by getting the doctor to hold up a sign. So if you say, I would like a picture of a doctor with a sign, and it says the word black on it, you know that something's happened to your prompt because otherwise it, it might have the word sign on it, I mean, or doctor on it, right? Clearly someone has added something to the, the prompt because it's identified that it's looking for a person and that OpenAI reasonably wants the data set to be less biased than the, or appear to be less biased than it has been. It seems that they're manipulating the prompts in order to produce you know, more globally representative uh, images coming out. Now, I, I fully in support of the idea of trying to debias the data set, so that's, that's probably a good thing. Um, but it's, it's questionable to me um, whether they should do it by changing what the customers are asking for. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's definitely a, a difficult subject, um, but it's, you know, this is one approach, um, but it's, it's kind of amusing that you can discover what they're doing by probing it and, in various ways and you know, people enjoy you know, poking holes in this.
Okay, so let's move on to what Imogen is about. Um, Imogen is, has some great images, and I have to say I I do like the the quality of these these Google images. That they, they do have a kind of a, a googly um, innocence about them in some ways, which is kind of weird. Um, like the the, the sushi uh, house corgi. Anyway, uh, one of the nice things um, that the, that comes from this is that. Google has done this by using a language model rather than clip as their source of the, the text embedding. So they're using a T5 model, which is a properly trained uh, language model um, with an encoder decoder kind of structure. Um, but they use a very large pre-trained model, which you can train on huge amounts of text. So the text models can be trained on much larger data sets than the text image models, because text image is kind of a specialist niche with only billions of, of examples. Whereas for pure text, we've got trillions of tokens which are available. Um, the, the size of the text training sets are enormous. So what they find or kind of prove by example here is that scaling up the language model actually is, scale, is worth more than scaling up the image processing. Um, because what they see, what you can see when you try this, is if you describe a complex scene, um, the uh, T5 model can actually capture the, the relationships between the things you're describing better than um, Clip does. And the, in a way, this is kind of understandable because what Clip has done is it's learned the English language through uh, reading lots of captions. Now, if you're talking about stuff which doesn't occur often in captions, Clip's not going to have a strong idea. So if you're talking about things which appear in the image, Clip's going to be fine. But if you're talking about the relationship between lots of different things in the image, Clip might not have a good idea of how language works sufficiently to communicate that. Whereas the T5 thing um, know, knows or understands a lot about uh, language, so it can actually pick up these, um, these nuances much better and then the the image size of this you know has to learn to, to pick out the, the various elements. Um, I guess another piece of this, which you know was key in the Google's thing, is they also try to make it like have an adjustment so that if your the the pixel values go outside of regular ranges, which is something which will happen if you do this classifier free guidance. Um, they have a nice method for coping when, when this thing is getting to, you know, out of bounds, a kind of a rescaling, remapping thing, um, which means that they can use much higher, like classifier, free guidance weights, um, which boosts performance in terms of class, you know, classifier free guidance. Um, I, I guess another thing to point out with Imogen is they have three models to do this. Um, one of which works at like fairly low resolution and then have some upsampler models which do diffusion based upsampling um, you know, guided by the prompt as well. So there's a whole bunch of models to train here. Google spent a lot on the compute. Um, somehow I doubt they're going to come out with a uh, an API for this, but it's definitely proved that Google can also play this game. And now on to the final of these, which is in some ways like the, um, the the big result, um, because this is the open model. So Stable Diffusion was released in uh, August 22, um, and the code and the models was released all as open source. Now the caveat here is the there's a license which means which says essentially don't make images we don't approve of, um, which is basically that they they kind of want to discourage people making images of politicians saying things which misrepresent their positions or you know there's kind of um, a line which they don't really want people to cross of course people will immediately cross it um, but at least the sentiment is there that this is not a, a fully open model that you can do anything you like with um, but there's you know should people should observe some kind of restraint um, on the other hand um, people have been experimenting and that experimentation has proved extremely fruitful and we're going to see some ways in which uh, people have expanded what can be done with these models because they're willing to, to play with it and, and press the models to do unexpected things. So let's talk a little bit 
about some of the other things which you know, people have come up with recently um, because they've been able to fiddle with the stable diffusion model um, and you know, basically expand the repertoire of things which are available. Uh, I've got just picked out a few things here, um, and but there's you know, more stuff is arriving all the time. I guess in, in the future work thing, I, I would have mentioned the make it, let's make a movie, um, but this has actually come out within the last few days. So, so this is kind of no longer just future work. Um, there's a lot which is going on right now. Okay, so for in painting and out painting, this is this kind of task is suppose I had someone sitting on this bench and I wanted to remove them. Basically, I can mask them out and get the uh, the stable diffusion model to paint in what would what it thinks is most likely to go in that space. Um, so this is a kind of a a normal task, remove a person from a picture. Um, the way in which this is done, we, we already is that we already know what most of the image has got to be. Now, absent the mask, most of the image is fixed. Um, so what we can do is we can noise up the whole image, just as if it was part of the whole process, and then guide the pixels to whatever they want to be. But we also know the truth. So we can actually fix up all the pixels which um, are it you know we are actually known we can actually guide them for sure to what towards what we we know to be the truth um but the pixels we don't know okay those are allowed to denoise in the normal way so everything would just kind of fall into place because the outsides are kind of falling into place at the right into the right pixels the insides will fall into place and and mesh perfectly because um the you know that's the most reasonable way of, of in painting the picture and, and we're with all these distributional things we're looking for like the most reasonable way or a good way which explains everything which we see um this, sorry the same could be said for out painting so here we've got an image which we know is is a is a good image we now have some you know surrounds which we want to fill in um we can just keep the we can keep iterating this forwards um, knowing what this is, but the, essentially dragging the surrounds to be a nice image as well, so that they mesh perfectly. And that then ties into something where uh, people actually have another constraint that they want to be able to tile these images. So it's quite difficult to see from this one, but in fact, um, if you actually play around with these images, you, the one side of the image perfectly matches what the other side and, and same with top and bottom. So here we've got a diffusion process, except you've also got the additional constraint with whatever's at the top should equal whatever's at the bottom. And so having the constraints actually fairly easy to implement. And because every time um, you move forward to step, you can then kind of re-insist that this, this constraint holds true. And so um, this tiling thing is, is something which people involved in newspapers and, and maybe Minecraft, not not just wallpaper and maybe Minecraft really care about be the tileability of textures, uh, maybe um, printing for fabrics as well. Um, so this is kind of a very niche application, but it's the kind of example of things which people innovate for. Um, here's a nice trick, which there are collab notebooks out there if you want to Essentially, this is very impressive for children. Um, if you have kids, I'd highly recommend to try this. Um, basically, you can get a drawing, which is you know, kids. Kids drawings can be a bit abstract, but they, they kind of know what they want. Um, maybe they, they can't haven't got the facility to actually to make it. You take a drawing, um, you then noise it up. So, so basically with stable diffusion, you put it into the latent space. You noise it in the latent space, but not fully, so it's completely, completely noise. You noise it maybe halfway, or, or maybe only a quarter way. So it's a bit of a noisy image in the latent space, but then you give it a prompt, and then you prompt it well, well, with whatever the child really thinks the image is of. So here it's going to be, um, you know, pixie or whatever. Um, you know, oh, my drawing is of a pixie. Um, and and, it, and she should have this kind of hair or whatever. And then so given that, you then describe the image um, in a prompt, but because you're working not from pure noise all the way to the image, you're working from a essentially a sketch of the image in latent space, there's only relatively few things it can do 
to come up with it to, to match the prompt. So the actual prompt will turn out looking very much like the original image, the original drawing, but if you want it to be you know, high resolution on ArtStation using or using a Canon D5, you can make photorealistic images from children's drawings. This um, the overall structure is you know, set by the, the children's drawings and the prompt, and you can have a nice discussion about um, you know what the child wanted, how much they like the new image, all this kind of thing. So a very, very nice experience. Okay, so. I've just got a few things which I've a few papers that I've pulled out for the the future. Um, my, this is a little coming soon list. Um, there would also be uh, the idea of let's make a movie. Uh, Facebook has come out with a, a a movie generation thing, which is kind of variations of a th uh, of an image. Um, there's been some other ones. I, I suspect it's all to do with the ICLR deadlines. They're trying to uh, get out ahead of the kind of uh, going anonymous blanket while the review period is going on. Um, so there's been a, a flurry in the last week of new stuff coming out. Um, my guess is that the big labs will go quiet for a bit until the, the next major deadline. But the people have been working on other things. So I have just picked a few uh, interesting uh, directions to take this. And this is not a kind of a, a wholehearted recommendation that this is the great the, the greatest. On the other hand, you know, these people are doing interesting work. Um, I, I, in particular, point out this motion diffuse paper because it's from a Singapore university. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're part of the Singapore meetup. Um, we'd be glad to talk to people at NTU if they were to reach out for us. So, okay. Cold diffusion. So this is kind of an interesting idea. And there's there's another there's something I think soft diffusion. Uh, there's another. Um, there's a couple of works in this direction saying, well, it's it's all very well doing this Gaussian noise, but there are lots of other ways to noise up an image. Maybe we can use these kind of other noisy methods um, to come up with, you know, kind of a different approach than just pure Gaussian noise. Um, and so the, uh, as well as relaxing this Gaussian thing, that also introduces other issues because you can't just add distributions together in the same way um, but with a few correction terms you can get some pretty nice results out and so this you know that this uh, paper's noised it in a whole different variety of ways either fading out or you know within a restricted circle or with a pixelation um, so there's an interesting it's interesting that it doesn't have to be a pure Gaussian process you can kind of fix up just any old process. That's an interesting thing to watch. Okay, so this this is the NTU paper, which is a motion um, generation paper. Um, so they're interested in can we get a text guided motion for a three D um, skeletal form? And so this is basically they've got a whole bunch of skeletons that they can make noisy arrangements of them. They essentially then make them come together to be nice skeletons again um, or with nice joint angles based upon the text prompt. So this is basically that they, they take um, what would be like a random field um, and then make it up into something which would be the motion. Um, and it comes together pretty nicely. There have also been um, other examples of this just recently, I, I guess for the ICLR thing. Um, people are interested in making motions. And you can also imagine this in lots of other fields um, where you know, you're interested in, there's been a robotics one as well, I think from the Bear Lab, where they're interested in motion planning by diffusion. So the criteria there is, I have random motions, I want it to satisfy these constraints, um, let's iterate these until they get better and better and closer and closer to the constraints. Um, something which I, I'm, I'm keen on is, is uh, TTS, um, so text to speech. And so here, one of the key problems is making like beautiful spectrograms, which you can then invert. Um, or, or basically, you can pass and a beautiful spectrogram can be passed into a, a GAN like process, which will make a very nice. Um, speech waveforms coming out. But can you make a sufficiently satisfactory um, male spectrogram uh, to do this with? 
And the answer is yes, the diffusion thing can work well. And even this can be done in rather few steps. Uh, another uh, neat thing which they do here is they take the diffusion process, which is, could be a long process of many steps, but then they say, well, can I actually do two steps in one by distilling the model? So basically they'll train another, they've trained a unit to go one step at a time. Now we can use that as a teacher to go two steps at a time. And then we can use that as a teacher to go four steps at a time. So basically they can compress the number of steps by making successively more um, you know, bolder students, which really understand how to take bigger leaps. So this is something where, you know, now we can get to kind of more real time production. And so because we can constrain these uh, diffusion processes in lots of different ways, um, it's much more promising for kind of a prosody, all these other things we might want to do for speech. Um, finally, one final one here is text generation. So we know how to produce text essentially one word at a time. So this will be a, the GPT kind of model. Um, but suppose I want the text to satisfy some constraints. So in particular, the constraint they talk about is suppose I want the text to have a certain format in terms of the parse tree. So the kind of thing we're saying, suppose I want it to, to be not just subject, verb, object, but I want to have it all switched around and I want to have various clauses and I want to mention the time first. If I, if I want to do this generating one token at a time, it's very unlikely I'm going to have that parse tree. So I don't have to generate huge numbers of rollouts. Um, this is going to be impractical. So what they do instead is that they say, well, let's suppose we start with a, a bunch of like text tokens or something like text embeddings and then roll it forwards through a diffusion process and at each point measuring how likely is this to come towards the path that I want? I want to keep guiding it towards the path that, that is required. So this is kind of the same kind of thing, but applied to a very different field. Um, by nudging it in this way, we can actually satisfy all sorts of non-differentiable um, constraints because this classifier free guidance and also kind of imposing these constraints, we can do without being able to differentiate anything. So there's a whole bunch of other interesting directions, um, which are definitely things to watch for. Okay, in the description below, um, I'll link to some of these other resources. Uh, the first is from uh, Lillian Wang, who's got an excellent blog, including lots of good mathematical details and background on lots of different deep learning topics. Uh, she has an awesome blog, what no, what are diffusion models? Um, Google Brain has done an overview paper, um, kind of unifying a, a bunch of these different threads. Uh, Twenty-three page overview model, uh, overview paper, very nice. There was a tutorial at CVPR. Um, the the YouTube video is over three hours long. Uh, it's an academic approach, but um, very worthwhile. And if you're interested in kind of like a like a different perspective on some of the things I've uh, described. There's also Miss Coffee Bean, who has a like, how does stable diffusion work? Um, so if you're interested in like a different perspective, um, that, that's also a thumbs up from that. So as a wrap up, um, the advance, these advances are being made at a huge rate now. Uh, the steps which have all happened like during COVID have been enormous. So hopefully everyone else else has had a you know, COVID projects as successful as this. Um, but now everyone can get inspired because everyone has access to stable diffusion models. You can run it on a commodity GPU um, or you could run it on Google's CoLab uh, you know, very successfully. People have been getting it so you can train bigger and bigger models and run all sorts of different configurations. Uh, you can do the you know, in painting, out painting, they're making UIs. There's an explosion of people, explosion of ideas here um, caused you know, by the power of open source. So this is a super exciting times and it kind of proves that actual you know, open AI is, is a very worthwhile thing. And that's like true democratization of what's going on. Of course, open AI, Google, DeepMind, these people are doing great work and Facebook. 
um, but there's nothing like releasing for everyone to try. So as a final piece of advertising, let me just uh, reiterate, this is uh, content which came from the Singapore Machine Learning Meetup. Please join that group if you want. Um, or um, I will be putting you know, some of my content on my YouTube channel, um, which has been, there's been quite a lot of Minecraft on this recently because of the Mine RL uh, competition, which is occurring at NeurIPS. Um, but I'll also try and put up some of my content for the Meetup and also other interesting things that I see you know, whether it's cloud GPUs um, or other deep learning stuff, you know, hopefully there'll be more to, more to come. See you next time.